Well, please turn with me in your Bible to Lamentations 1.1. Lamentations 1.1. Go to the major prophets. It's stuck right in the middle of all those major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. If you hit Ezekiel, you miss Lamentations. Go back. It's, it's, it's the little five chapter book stuffed in the middle of all those really big books. Or if you've got a digital copy of your Bible, you just pulled it up and hit Lamentations and you're already there. But today we are embarking on a study of the book of Lamentations, which really is a book that's not commonly studied, at least not verse by verse through the whole book. In fact, in preparation for this study, I went on sermonaudio.com, which is a great website. You can download lots of great sermons on there. But just out of curiosity, I said, how many sermons are there on sermonaudio.com on the book of Lamentations? And what I found is that there are about 1,300 sermons on the book of Lamentations. Now, that might sound like a lot to you, but if you look closer, you'll see that over 800 of those are from Lamentations chapter 3 alone. When you get to chapters 4 and 5, there's only about 75 sermons on the book, uh, on Lamentations 4 and 5. You say, what does that mean? It means there's a bunch of people who are floating in and preaching sermons from chapter 3, but only about 75 examples of, of preachers preaching through the entire book. You say, 75, that kind of sounds like a lot. Okay, well just for reference sake, I also looked up the book of Jude, which is just one chapter. There are over 2,000 sermons on the book of Jude. 75 examples of going through the entire book of Lamentations. 2,000 on the book of Jude. And just for comparison's sake, I looked up the book of James, which, like Lamentations, has five chapters. For the book of James, there are well over 10,000 sermons on the book of James, and they're divided pretty evenly, about 2,000 for each chapter. So... If you're counting at home, if you're keeping score, that's 75 examples of an exposition of Lamentations and over 2,000 examples of an expo- uh, uh, exposition of the book of James. Now, obviously, this is not scientific research. I spent more time trying to explain it to you than I did actually researching it online. Uh, but it does tell us what we probably already know, doesn't it? That Lamentations is not a book that we spend a lot of time studying and thinking about. In fact, we might even say that Lamentations is a neglected book. You say, well, why would the book of Lamentations be neglected? Well, one of the reasons why it's a neglected book is because the book of Lamentations is in the Old Testament. And a lot of times we just have a hard time understanding the Old Testament because of all the issues that go into that. We don't understand that if we just look at the original meaning, we'll see the ongoing significance of it. And we tend to skate past the Old Testament straight to the New Testament. And so for all the things that go with that, and for all those reasons, Lamentations can often be neglected just because it's in the Old Testament, not the New. Another reason why the book of Lamentations is often a neglected book is because it's one giant lament. It's like a funeral dirge. In other words, it's not very uplifting. You don't, you don't read through it, man, I really need some encouragement today. I'm going to Lamentations and I'm going to read the whole thing through. You might go to Lamentations 3, but the whole thing is pretty heavy. See, a lament is a poetic and passionate expression of grief and sorrow. That's what a lament is. It's a, it's a poetic and passionate expression of grief and sorrow. And that's what we find in the book of Lamentations. In fact, when it comes to Hebrew poetry, uh, Lamentations is one of the most incredible examples of Hebrew poetry that we find in the entire Old Testament. This is a a highly organized and incredibly thought through example of literature. You see, uh, the the entire book, basically, with the exception of portions in chapter 5, but the entire book uh, uses what's called an acrostic format. In other words, each chapter uses the Hebrew alphabet for an outline. 
So in chapter 1, you'll notice that there are 22 verses. You know how many Hebrew letters there are in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. Each verse begins with the next letter in the alphabet. That takes a lot of time to think through, doesn't it? And by the way, the reason most likely that the author did this was it was a way of communicating completeness. In other words, whenever, whenever the author deals with a particular, particular area of sorrow in a chapter, that author can say, from A to Z, I have covered this topic. That's the point. And so it's a highly organized example of a Hebrew lament. Actually, in the Hebrew Bible, the, the title of the book isn't Lamentations. That's, of course, a English title. The Hebrew title is, it would be literally translated, How? How? And that comes from the very first word in chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, How lonely sits the city. And that, that how there, it's, it's not just a question, it's an exclamation. It's an expression of deep sorrow and mourning. I won't try to dramatically reenact it for you, but you can imagine the poet uh, crying out how in deep pain and sorrow. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she who is great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. And that sets the tone for the entire book. See, Lamentations is, it's a dirge song. It, it's, it's funeral literature. In the book of Lamentations, we find the author trying to figure out how this suffering is possible in light of God's character. How, how can these things be happening in light of what I know about God? It's a heavy book. It's a heavy book. And it's a thorough book. In Lamentations, each chapter is a complete poem in and of itself. So, this is one of those examples. Sometimes the chapter divisions in our English Bible provide almost more confusion than they provide clarity. However, in the book of Lamentations, what you have is five individual poems all put together. And each one of these complete poems, each one of these chapter, provides a way of of thinking through or processing some element of human suffering. So for instance, in chapter 1, we see the cause of suffering. We see the complete devastation of man's sin. When we get into chapter 1 next week, we're going to spend a few weeks in chapter 1, and we're going to see that that sin is, is utterly and completely and from A to Z devastating. In that moment of temptation... Gratification might seem awesome, but in the light of God's truth, in the light of what is actually true, sin is devastating. It is absolutely devastating, and we see that in chapter 1. In chapter 2, we see God's sovereignty over suffering. In chapter 2, we have a complete description of God's discipline. You want to know what God's wrath against sin will look like? Chapter 2 is going to help us with that. Chapter 3 is what we could call a guide to suffering. You're in the midst of suffering. How do you walk through that? Well, chapter 3 provides a complete prescription of what it looks like to faithfully suffer through your trial. Chapter 4, we might call this the scope of suffering. And in chapter 4, we have a caution against God's wrath. A caution against God's wrath. You think suffering in this life is awful. Imagine the suffering that takes place under the eternal wrath of a holy and almighty God. Chapter 4 will warn us of that. And then in chapter 5, we have what we might call a chapter that's about the Savior of suffering. Because in chapter 5, the people petition God's mercy. So there's this A to Z complete 
petition for God's mercy in the midst of it. In other words, God, through their suffering, brought them to the place where what else were they going to do besides cry out to the Lord? They came to the end of themselves and they had to cry out to the Lord in the midst of their suffering. And so, Lamentations is a book that even though it's five chapters, it's a book that is characterized by its thoroughness. By its thoroughness. Additionally, it's worth noting that the book is organized in, in what commentators would call a chiastic structure. Chiasm, it speaks of the shape of the literature. Uh, most, most of the literature that we're used to uh, follows a plot line and crescendos in the resolution of that plot line right before the end of it. In a chiastic structure, it's almost like the mountain is right in the end, uh, right in the middle instead of at the end. It crescendos not at the end of the book, but in the middle of the book. And so you're rising to the main point, the climax of the book, and then you come down essentially the same path that you went up. And that's the, the literary structure that we find in the book of Lamentations. Chapters 1 and 5 match each other by focusing on the, the plight and the prayer of Jerusalem. So in chapters 1 and 5, you have the introduction and the conclusion, and they match each other. Chapter 1, you, you see the awful situation of Jerusalem from Jerusalem's perspective. And in chapter 5, you see Jerusalem crying out to the Lord in prayer. Then in chapters 2 and 4, you see all of this suffering, you see this punishment on Jerusalem, you see it from God's perspective. You see in chapter 2, the wrath of God. You see in chapter 4, the righteousness of God. In chapter 2, a description of God's punishment. And in chapter 4, a vindication of God's punishment. Here's why he was righteous to do it. And then in chapter 3, you find the, the apex of the book. And in chapter 3, we find a description of God's faithfulness toward His people even in the midst of suffering. That's where this book is driving us toward. That, by the way, is why as you read through it, you'll find that chapter 3 doesn't have 22 verses. If you're familiar with the book of Lamentations, you know that chapter 3 has 66 verses. So that's 22 times 3. Each letter of the Hebrew alphabet doesn't just have one verse. It has three verses to go with it. There's much more there. Because chapter 3 is what the entire book is driving us toward. See, the message of the book is intended to take people who are suffering in the midst of a sinful world and drive them to look towards the faithfulness of God. So, that's a lot of information for you about Lamentations, isn't it? <laughs> That's a lot of information. But it's still, as we stand on the precipice of this study, it still leaves us with a couple of questions about our study. First of all, it leaves us with a question, why did God record this lament in the Bible? Why is the book of Lamentations, even there. I mean, think about all the things that God could have recorded. Think about all the things that God could have inspired. Why did God inspire an entire book of the Bible that's, that's nothing more than a funeral dirge? Well, one reason God recorded this lament in the Bible is because there was real suffering to lament about. See, the book of Lamentations isn't just some book about lamenting and suffering. It's a book that took place and was written in the midst of real historical circumstances, particularly the fall of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. You see, for 18 months, the Babylonians had surrounded the city of Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And that 18 months was horrific. Horrific. You know what happens in a siege, right? You know how much food comes in? 
None. You know how much water comes in? None. They might have had a little water piped in through tunnels that they were able to use, but you had an entire city enclosed in the walls. There's nothing going out. There's nothing coming in. You have people starving to death. We'll see in the book of Lamentations that you had mothers eating their own children to stay alive. You you have the wealthiest people in the city selling all of their goods just to pay for bread. You have starvation. You You have deprivation. You have some of the worst atrocities that you can imagine going on for 18 months. And at the end of that 18 months, you know what happened? The Babylonians finally knocked down the gates, knocked down the walls, stormed the city, killed a lot of the people, carried off into slavery basically everybody else, and burned the whole thing to the ground. It was utter devastation. Total destruction. So you say, well, why would God record a lament? Well, there was a lot to lament about. There's a lot to lament about, wasn't there? I mean, we're not just talking about suffering here. We are talking about significant suffering. Look at Lamentations chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Just listen to the description. And understand, this this is not uh, 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 hypothetical poetry. This is a poetic description of what was really taking place. It says, The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. The, 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 the children were starving to death. Look In chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, listen to this. Look, O Lord, and see, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? You see what's going on there, don't you? I mean, that, that is how bad the situation was. It goes on and says, Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. Where, where are you going to take the dead bodies to bury them when the city's under siege? You're not. Where are they? They're piled up in the streets. My young women and young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. God's wrath God's punishment upon the city of Jerusalem was without pity. So we say, why a lament? Well, because there's no genre of literature more appropriate to communicate the sorrow that went with this kind of remarkable suffering than a lament. Why was there a lament? Because there was real suffering going on. And by the way, that real suffering, at least in the case of the book of Lamentations, that real suffering was a self-inflicted suffering. You know why the people experienced the wrath of God in this fashion? It was because they rejected the truth of God. They rejected the Word of God. They sinned against the Lord. For decades and decades and decades, for hundreds of years, the Lord had been warning His people, calling them to repentance, calling them to faithfulness. And from time to time, the people would kind of turn back. For instance, in the days of Josiah, you had a massive reform. But then when you look at that reform closely, it was all external. As soon as Josiah was gone, the people turned right back to their wicked ways tenfold. The Lord was a 
abundantly patient with His people. Warning and warning and warning. Bringing His punishment in incremental fashions before pouring it all out on them to give them an opportunity to repent. But did they repent? No. They used the patience of the Lord as an opportunity to store up more wrath for themselves. Look in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Her foes have become the head. That's the Babylonians taking them over. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her. Why did the Lord afflict her? What was it unjust? Was it unfair what God did? No, it says right here. The Lord afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Again, look at verse 8. Beginning of verse 8 says, Jerusalem sinned grievously. Chapter 1, verse 14. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. My transgressions. Why was this yoke of wrath placed upon them? It was because of their transgressions. You see, the people had the double burden of not only enduring this suffering, but knowing that this suffering was the result of their sin. It was punishment. Which makes this lament appropriate because in addition to sorrow, laments can also express repentance. And Israel had a lot to lament and repent about, didn't they? So God gave us this lament because there was real suffering. And by the way, we find this lament in the Scripture because there were real people suffering. Not just real suffering, but this is these are real people going through this. This is not a poem expressing the hypothetical dangers of sin and rejecting the Word of the Lord. No, this is a real person, a real man who is expressing his grief and sorrow. It's a real person expressing real pain. Now, we're not told in the book of Lamentations itself who wrote the book, but we can be very confident that it was the prophet Jeremiah. We can be very confident of this because whoever wrote the book of Lamentations was a first-hand eyewitness to the fall of Jerusalem. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, I am the man who has seen affliction. In other words, whoever's writing this lament, they saw it happen with their own eyes. Well, that's certainly the case in Jeremiah the prophet. If you read through Jeremiah chapter 39, you'll see that Jeremiah was right there through all of this. He had been warning the people for decades that this was going to happen. And now when it finally happened, he didn't get to skate. He didn't get to pass on it. He had to go through it. He was an eyewitness to it all. Now, another reason we can be confident that Jeremiah did in fact write the book is because whoever wrote this book must have been a well-known author. Because if he wasn't a well-known author, guess what would have happened? He would have put his name to it. The fact that there's no name in the book of Lamentations indicates most likely that everybody knew who wrote it, which meant everybody knew who this guy was. Recently I was reading through a biography of Ben Franklin and many, many of the articles that he wrote for periodicals and newspaper, he never put his name to, but everybody knew who wrote them. Not because he put his name there, but because everybody knew what his opinions were. Everybody knew his writing style, and everybody knew who he was. He was maybe the most famous man in colonial America at that time. Everybody just knew, oh, Franklin wrote that. Well, that, in all likelihood, was the case with the book of Lamentations. The prophet Jeremiah had been ministering to the people in Judah for four decades. In fact, Jeremiah was prophet to the people throughout the, the, the duration of six different kings. Six different kings. He saw it all. He saw it all. The people knew his voice. And so when he wrote the book of Lamentations, people knew who it was. Now, in addition to this biblical evidence, we also have some historical evidence. 
For instance, the Septuagint, which is the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, identifies Jeremiah as the author, as well as virtually every historical uh, source that we have. Additionally, when you read through the book of Lamentations, you know what it sounds like? When you read through the book of Lamentations, it sounds just like something that Jeremiah would write. In fact, Jeremiah is often known as the weeping prophet. And he's not known as the weeping prophet just because of what he wrote in the book of Lamentations. But throughout his ministry, he was known for his laments. In fact, you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 25, it says, this is when Josiah was killed in battle, it says, Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah. And all the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah in their laments to this day. They made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. So here we find Jeremiah writing laments. Even in the book of Jeremiah, we find laments within the book of Jeremiah. And so every indication that we have is that Jeremiah wrote this, peop- uh, this book to the people. And I don't even think we can begin to imagine the sorrow that he felt when he wrote it. He'd been warning the people. He'd been warning the people. He even said, he got to the point where he received the word from the Lord and he said, look, We're not going to hold out against the Babylonians. If we just surrender, the Lord will make our punishment easier. What'd they do? They doubled down. They tried to make alliances with the nations. They doubled down. They tried to show their own military force. They doubled down and and, and acted as if they could appease the Lord with with all these other uh, uh, hypocritical external works. And Jeremiah just kept warning them, look, You've got to submit to the punishment of the Lord. And if you will bow your knee at the beginning of it, it will be much easier. Did the people listen to him? No. No. And if you think, if, if you think that Jeremiah received any sense of pleasure or vindication in seeing the people punished just like he said he was going to happen then then you have no idea what it is to publicly proclaim the word of god there is nobody there is nobody who by the spirit that's a godly man who proclaims the word of god who takes any pleasure in seeing people punished when they reject the word of god there's nobody who takes pleasure in that I mean, not only did Jeremiah have to endure this sorrow, but he had to endure this sorrow knowing that all of his warnings went unheeded. We have the book of Lamentations because there are real people like Jeremiah suffering in the fall of Jerusalem. But we also have this book of Lamentations for another reason. You see, God put this book in the Bible because there is real hope available to people who are suffering. Remember I told you earlier that the apex of this book, the very center of this book is chapter 3. Well, the very center of chapter 3 is chapter 3, verse 23, which says, Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faith. That's really what's going on in the book of Lamentations. In the book of Lamentations, you have a godly man broken and humbled under the, the, the punishing hand of the Lord. And you have this godly man, Jeremiah, saying, how can I rectify these two truths in my mind that God is faithful and at the same time that I'm enduring this suffering? How can, how, how, how can I reconcile that? How is it that God can be faithful and, and, and the people can be starving to death in the city? How is it that God can be faithful and, and His chosen people are taken off into slavery? 
That's really what's going on in this book. This lament is the prophet trying to process this suffering in light of God's faithfulness. And what we're going to find as we study through this book is that as the prophet laments and processes his way through this suffering, here's what he finds. That even in the midst of suffering, God is always faithful to His character. God did not violate His character, His holiness in any way when He punished the city of Jerusalem. When He punished His people for their sins. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 18, listen to what it says. The beginning of this verse says, The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against His word. In fact, literally, you could translate the Hebrew here, the Lord is righteous. Never in this punishment that God sent on His people, never did He violate His righteous character. He acted in accord with His holiness. The fact that Israel was defeated and taken into captivity. The nations around might have said, oh, that's proof that Yahweh is not God. But that's not what was going on at all. The fact that the Babylonians came in and destroyed the city wasn't proof that God is weak. It was proof that God is holy. And God will not let a people who is called by His name go into idolatry and sin. He'll cut that out. He's not going to let a temple stand in His name when it is being defiled generation after generation. He's going to take that down. He acted in accord with His character. He was faithful to His character. Also, here's what the prophet figures out as he's lamenting his way through this sorrow. The prophet also reasons that God is faithful to His Word. I love our God so much. He's so good. He's always faithful to His Word. What, this, is, this, is, this is why the Bible is so important to our church. God's never going to do anything that contradicts what He says in His Word. Ever! All flesh like grass. Flower pops up. Fades away. Blown away by the wind. But the Word of the Lord endures forever. Forever. That's exactly what happened when God destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Chapter 1, verse 21. It says, They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it, God. Listen to this. You have brought the day you announced. Did God just capriciously jump in and do this without any warning? No. He announced it through the prophet for decades. And they said, that's never going to happen to us. That's never going to happen to us. we got a new king now with new policies. That's not going to happen to us. We've got an alliance with Egypt. You're telling me that God is going to do that to us? Pfft. And God announced it. God announced it. He acted faithfully to what He said He was going to do. In fact, look at chapter 2, verse 17. I mean, what a warning this is against being presumptuous against the Lord. To presume upon Him that He won't act the way He said He would act. Chapter 2, verse 17 says, The Lord has done what He purposed. He has carried out His Word. God was not taken by surprise when after an 18-month siege, the Babylonians knocked down the city of Jerusalem. In fact, it is exactly what He said it was going to happen. In fact, if we go all the way back, which we will in the course of our study, but if we go all the way back to Deuteronomy 28, this is exactly what God warned the people about when they entered into the land. I'm making a covenant with you. And here are all the blessings if you keep that covenant. Here are all the blessings if you follow after My Word. But here are the curses that will take place if faithlessly you reject everything that I've said. 
I'm warning you, Israel. I'm warning you. Not because I'm a vindictive, I'm going to pay you back God, but because I'm a loving God who wants you to know the consequences of sin and know the consequences of rebelling against me. There is absolutely no way after giving them the truth, after, after renewing the covenant with them in the book of Deuteronomy, the covenant made and, and, and explicated in the book of Exodus, and then you got renewal of it in the book of Deuteronomy, and then all the prophets after the book of Deuteronomy keep going back to Deuteronomy and reminding the people of Israel of all these things that God has said. There's no way that you can get to 587 and the people of Israel could say, if we had only known. Now they rejected the word of the Lord, but God did not reject His own word. He was faithful to His word. And notice also, from the book of Lamentations, God was also faithful to His people. So wait a minute, I thought He was pouring out His wrath and punishing His people. Yeah, He was. He was. But he continued to be faithful towards his people. Look at chapter 3, verse 22. Here we see that, that God, that Yahweh kept his covenant love and mercy toward his people. They were facing the covenant consequences of rejecting their Lord, but their Lord had not rejected them. Chapter 3, verse 22. You're familiar with it. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That's our word that we learned, by the way, in Hebrew, uh, 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 the Hebrew word from the book of Ruth, and in Psalm 107, that Hesed love, that covenant, loyal, faithful love. The Hesed of the love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Think about the historical context in which Jeremiah was writing that. He may very well have been on a hill looking out over rubble that once was the city of God. And what was his conclusion? Your punishment came, but your mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Lord, You took away the city. You swept up the faithful and the unjust in this punishment. But You have not taken Yourself away from me. I still have You. You're still faithful to me. Again, verse 32 but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. In other words, God is always faithful to his people. He's faithful even in the midst of suffering. You won't be able to see it, probably. You definitely won't feel it. You'll feel like nobody's ever experienced anything like this in, in the entire history of the world. And woe is me. And nobody's got it as bad as me. And nobody understands. That's all the flesh lying to you. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. In the midst of your suffering, here are the realities that you can hang your spiritual hat on. God is always faithful to His character. He never changes. He's always faithful to His Word. He never lies. He's always faithful to His people. He always loves. In the midst of your suffering, you can trust God will be faithful to His character, His Word, and His people. That's where the book of Lamentations has taken us. That's where it's taken us. That's why God gave us the book. In His wisdom, God gave us a lament because there was real suffering done by real people who needed real hope. But that leads to a second question that it's worth considering for just a moment. Okay, that's why God put it in the Bible. But why are we studying it? Like, like why here? Why now? Why on a Sunday morning? Well, obviously it's in the Bible, so we should study it. 
But more than that, we need to study this lament because you know what? There's still real suffering going on in this world in our own lives, isn't it? We may not have been there for the fall of Jerusalem, but in God's perfect providence, we'll have suffering of our own that we'll have to endure, won't we? And even if you aren't presently in the midst of suffering, you will be, and you need to know how to process it, how to think through it. The book of Lamentations helps us to process the significant suffering that can arise in our lives. That's what a lament is. It's not venting. I just needed to vent. Okay. Chapter and verse me on that one. Chapter and verse me on that one. Where in the Bible do you see that you need to give voice to your sinful, rebellious anger and selfish self-pity? Well, you don't. And you only make those things stronger when you vent. That's not what a lament is. A lament isn't venting. It's processing. It's thinking through the realities of suffering in light of God's truth. And that, by the way, is so much better than the other extreme. You got, you got on the one extreme, uh, unbiblical extreme of this venting. If I just get it off my chest, I'll feel better. No, if you deal with it biblically, you'll do better. But on the other side, you've got the, I'm okay. I'm okay. We're good. Guys, you know that guy. The we're good guy. Yeah, you know something's boiling and brewing underneath there, but I'm okay. I'm okay. Is that biblically processing or thinking through your situation? No. It's suppressing the reality of it. Neither one of those are healthy, and a lament helps us to avoid both. You see, a a lament is an invitation from the Lord to bring our confusion, to bring our sorrow, to bring our struggle, to bring our battles before Him. Lord, this is what's going on. Do you see this? I don't understand it. But here's the thing that makes the lament so spiritually beneficial for us. When, When we learn from it in the Scriptures and when we practice it in our own prayers, is in this form of biblical lament, guess what? You have to bring those confusions, those struggles, that pain. You have to bring it all under submission to the truth of God. And so a biblical lament, it forces us to control our response and consider our response in light of who God is and what God has said. You know what that looks like sometimes? Here's what that looks like sometimes. And you will see this in the book of Lamentations. God, you said your covenant love never ends and it feels like it's ended right now. I don't understand it, God. I don't understand it. Will you please help me to believe it? I've got to submit to it. I do submit to it. But boy, I don't see how this is true. I know you're true. I know it's right. I'm not going to let my feelings determine how I think about you. I'm going to let your revelation determine how I think about you. But Lord, look at my circumstances. I'm struggling. I'm confused. Help me to process it in light of what you've told me. And guess what? Sometimes the Lord doesn't give that answer in that moment. You say, Pastor, I prayed a prayer just like that, and then I didn't feel any better. I still had no idea why I was suffering. Yeah. Yeah. But guess what you did have to do that was beneficial? You had to trust the Lord, didn't you? Here's what God knows that oftentimes we forget. Strong faith, strong faith is infinitely more valuable than easy circumstances. And so if the Lord has to let you stay in suffering when you don't understand it and you can't reconcile it with God's truth, but you just have to trust Him in it, He knows what you need. And He knows you need strong faith more than you need to understand His sovereign eternal plan at that moment. But He invites you to come to Him and pray those prayers. And by the way, we need to understand how this works because not only are we going to be suffering at times, but at times the suffering like it was in Jerusalem is going to be self-inflicted. What do I mean by that? I mean, sometimes you're going to have to bear the consequences of sin in your life. 
If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you have received the forgiveness of sins for all of eternity. You do not have to bear the weight of God's wrath for eternity. You've been saved, delivered, declared righteous, and forgiven in Christ Jesus if you've repented and believed in Him. That, however, does not mean that you will escape all the temporary consequences of sin you might face in this life. doesn't mean that. And there are going to be times in your life, if you're an unbeliever, your whole life is dealing with the consequences of sin and you need to repent and believe in Jesus. If you're a believer, there are going to be times in your life when you fall into sin and you recognize it and you repent of it, but you're still going to have to walk with those consequences for however long the Lord sees fit. Lamentations provides us with the help we need in that circumstance. You see, the book of Lamentations is a lot like the book of uh, Job. Book of Job is really about suffering, isn't it? But here's where it's different. The book of Job is about suffering when you don't understand why. As far as we know, Job didn't find out exactly what was going on until he got up to heaven and somebody explained it to him. We read the end of Job, but Job likely didn't read the end of Job. So the book of Job is about faithfully suffering when you don't know why. Job teaches us to humble ourselves and wait on the Lord when we don't understand what's going on. Lamentations is a little bit different. Lamentations isn't so much about suffering when you don't know why. Lamentations is about suffering when you know exactly why. Lamentations is about dealing with the consequences of sin. Lamentations teaches us that we need to humble ourselves and repent to the Lord in the midst of suffering brought on by sin. We need the book of Lamentations because there's still real suffering. We need the book of Lamentations because there's still real people doing that real suffering, by the way. There are real people enduring trials in the Lord and apart from the Lord, and they don't know where to turn in their suffering. And so for us, by learning to process suffering in light of God's truth, guess what it's going to do? It's going to equip us to process through suffering in a way that honors the Lord, and it's going to equip us to shepherd and encourage others to do the same. And let me just tell you, church, we need to get good at that. We need to get good at that. No culture in the history of the world has had it as easy as ours. We're the richest culture ever. The poorest member of this congregation is doing better than Solomon in all his splendor. You may have less gold, but you have an air conditioner. (laughs) And I like air conditioning better than gold. I have something that Solomon never had. I have a coffee maker. (laughs) And we could go on and on and on. I guarantee you, the, 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 by, by all the technological standards of today, the meager mattress I sleep on is more comfortable than anything Solomon ever imagined, right? No culture in the history of the world has ever had it as easy and prosperous as we've had it. And let me tell you what, church, with the possible exception of Israel who had the promises and had the truth given to them, no culture in the history of the world has ever shook their fist at God the way our culture does today. Ever. The absolute rebellion and rejection of God's truth and standards that that are not only accepted, but they're pushed in our culture today. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning when you think about it from a biblical perspective. And as we look at the book of Lamentations, we're reminded. You don't shake your fist at the Word of the Lord. You don't reject the truth of the Lord without consequences. It doesn't happen. 
We will not escape judgment as a nation for some of the most high-handed sins in the history of the world. We won't. For the, for the millions of babies who have been murdered with government approval. For the, for the absolute rejection of God's truth about marriage and human sexuality. For the countless other cultural sins that we're plunging deeper and deeper into. Don't think that God's not watching. Oh, well, in the Old Testament, that was Israel. We're, we're different. You don't walk away from God's truth. You don't get further and further away from His revelation and do better. You do worse. You do worse. And let me tell you this. As Christians, we need to be very careful that we don't follow the path of Jerusalem. They were warned of impending judgment, but they said, you know what we need? We need a political solution to that. You know what we need? We need a military solution to that. Look, I pray for God's mercy and I pray that He'll use whatever means possible to, to lessen whatever judgment we have coming. But ultimately, our problem is a spiritual problem. And guess what, Christian? You say, well, I'm not a part of that. Did Jeremiah escape the suffering of Jerusalem? Was he faithful? Was he righteous? Did he warn the people? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But he still had to endure the suffering that went with it. And so unless the Lord turns His wrath, gives us more mercy, we know what we're looking at. Maybe not the exact details. I don't think the Babylonians are going to surround us here in Delaware. But as long as we're running away from the Lord, things aren't going to get better. Which means we, as a church, we need to learn to process this suffering. And we better, we better do a very good job of teaching our children how to do the same. If they think that the Lord is only faithful when they have all their wants and desires met, boy, you're setting them up for spiritual failure, aren't you? We need to train ourselves, we need to train our children not to prioritize comfort and safety in this world, but be prepared to faithfully suffer if that's what the Lord chooses. It's going to be real people. We need the book of Lamentations. We need it so we can be prepared. We also need it because even in the midst of all this, there's great hope, isn't there? There's great hope. If God willed, there could be no more America tomorrow. If that's what He chose, that's what would happen. Now, I pray that doesn't happen. Just like Scripture encourages me to pray, I pray for, for all men, especially government officials. I pray for mercy. But we're in the hands of the Lord. And no matter what happens from a temporary, temporal, earthly perspective, there's great hope in being in His hands, isn't there? You see, the hope that we have is not hope in the possibility of cultural change and the hope of political power. God can use those things. Those aren't bad things. But that's not where our hope rests, is it? Our hope is in the same place that Jeremiah's hope was in. The faithfulness of God. You see, the faithfulness of God that gave Jeremiah hope, it remains unchanged. All these generations later, God's still faithful. In fact, the faithfulness of God that Jeremiah hoped in, it's even more clear for us because we have the ultimate example of God's faithful love in the cross, don't we? That was a hope that Jeremiah was looking forward to one day. For us, that is a reality that has been revealed to us. We have the hope of Christ. We have the hope of Christ. And that's the hope that we must hold on to in the midst of whatever suffering the Lord chooses to bring. And that's why we're studying the book of Lamentations. We're studying Lamentations to teach us to deal with suffering in a way that honors God and strengthens our faith in His faithfulness. We pray with me?
Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Uh, Lord, we thank You for even the book of Lamentations, a book that most of us have not spent a lot of time studying. Lord, we pray that as we do study and dig into the specifics of it, Lord, we pray that You would give us an understanding of it and also give us insight into its implications for our own life. But more than anything, as we think about and process suffering in a sinful world, Lord, I pray that You would drive our hearts back to Your faithfulness and Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray all of these things in His precious name. Amen.